so if you read this slide, you can see that the person who is speaking to us today is amaz amazingly well-educated and is in the business of educating others about really important things like trauma. When I asked him why he does what he does, he said that trauma is one of those things that shows up in our lives in almost every way that you can imagine as we grow and is a precursor to mental health issues as we get older. So it's very, very important. But today he's gonna to be talking about something that is, can be traumatic, but it's not always, and that is civility and how we get along with each other. And hopefully we will um, get some takeaways. Doctor, would you like to come on up and we'll be happy to listen. Thank you. Um, I am not going to stand behind a podium. I don't, don't feel the need to do that. So I have a, I want you to start uh, in, at your tables. I'd like you in three minutes to come up with a consensus of the number one issue that you feel your group can work on, can do something about. You, whatever it is, concrete, abstract, one issue that you all agree is, is important on your table. And we'll come back to that at the end of my brief talk. Is that, people understand? Okay. So Meryl, let's have people um, online put out a proposed common issue that we can work on. I propose peace. Who else wants to um, join in? <laughs> yes, I was the exact yeah, same ahead, thing. Dominica. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Something like world peace. And the noise of Rory in February, but I think one can do that type of thing online with by sharing ideas, you know, so it could be an online that works on peace. I don't know if anyone else has any other uh, suggestions. Uh, and I'll jump in there. It, 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 it's related. It folds back in on itself with the topic, but it, it seems like we could work on having people communicate with civility and respect uh, as we move forward in the country. All right, you got about 30 seconds to agree. Those are tied in. I like Rocky Flats to stop kids from going onto Rocky Flats and people from going onto Rocky Flats. And that ties in with Dominica and peace building. So Thank we don't you, have to make bombs. And other input from our online crew. Jim, you got an idea there? No? Others? Okay. Wrap it up and come up with one thing. It's okay. If it's not perfect. Okay. We'll call it a day then. Meryl, if we need to agree on one subject, uh, Maria and I were with you, particularly on politics in this country, since it's more... Uh, uh, current event too. And, and Yanni, what was that specifically? Okay, everybody ready? Basically what you suggested, but apply to politics. Yeah. You ever absolutely. tell a group of Rotarians they're allowed to talk? Okay. <laughs> so um, as was mentioned, I'm a traumatologist uh, and one way that we often think about trauma is it's anything that threatens your sense of well-being and integrity. But when we really talk, when we're really saying that, what we're really talking about is going the wrong way, is this. 
We are survival machines, as is every living organism. We, we have two roles, right? To survive long enough to procreate. Those are the two, survive long and procreate. That's, that's, that's what organisms do. So, you know, one way to think about it is we're, you know, very robust and thoughtful mayflies. <clears throat> and I think that's really important because like has famously to be said, we have all of these things, all these ideas, thoughts, emotions, you know, buildings, civilization, and it's all commentary, right? This is where everything lands eventually, right? Whether you know it or not, whether you're thinking it through or not, everything happens because we think it enhances our survival. The decisions we make may be selfish decisions, may be group decisions, but we think it enhances our survival. Does that make sense to folks, All right? So, and one way we really know that is the stress response system, sometimes called the danger response system, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard of, is the most conserved system in the brain and nervous system in any mammal. And in fact, you take a rat, you look at its brain, you look at that, that system, it's almost identical to the one we have. Uh, so it's so conserved, it's so primary and basic that that's what we all are about. And I'm going to suggest and argue that both the conundrum we are now finding ourselves in, as well as solution, is in thinking about how to enhance our survival. I want to show you this. Um, this comes from a Harvard researcher, um, Marty Teicher. Um, and what I really, the reason I want to show you this is that survival is so central that evolution is completely a, directed to adapting to our environment in order to survive. Yeah. So early on in life, as your brain is being sculpted, which it does continually, uh, particularly in the first five years, but also up until about the early 20s, the environment has tremendous influence mm -hmm. on how the brain develops and how it's structured. So if you grow up in a stressful, difficult environment, your brain adapts to that environment that's before you at that time. And you know, one of the outcomes often in that stressful, difficult environment is that people will become more aggressive, more violent, more assertive in order to survive in that environment. The other polar opposite is you become more withdrawn more depressed, more isolated, because that's a way of staying safe. Don't go out into the streets and you'll be fine, right? Um, we all know people who are anxious people. It's hard to get them out of their house sometimes, isn't it, right? And that's one way of understanding that. On the flip side, if you grow up in a supportive, caring environment, right? Uh, you know, good schools, you live in Boulder, um, you're much more, much more likely to be a thoughtful person, thinking through things, being more collaborative because you're not worried about the other person doing something to you. And those are, I mean, obviously these are the, the extremes on either side, but this is literally what happens. And this is our, what, and this is brain. Our brains are changed in order to adapt. Now, of course, one of the dilemmas is if I get thrown into the, into the desert, I may not survive. Whereas the person who grew up in the, in the difficult environment has a better chance of surviving. 
The other thing that we see all the time is we have people who grow up in these very difficult, stressful environments who can't survive in what we call civilization, right? They, they don't, it doesn't make sense to them. It doesn't work. Our rules don't really work. I'm sure you've all heard about kids entering school and not being, knowing how to stand in line, not knowing how to wait their turn, not pushing each other, so on and so forth, right? Well, why wouldn't they if they didn't grow up with that kind of supportive environment, right? So they enter school, civilization, and they don't know how to behave. Right? So this is something that we, we really see. And I, and I just want to point out that this is quintessential to who we are. So we do have an interesting issue and dilemma, right? What is truth? Uh, you know, if you're religious, you think there's an absolute truth that came from God. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if, that, if that's true. People have been seeking absolute truth, objective truth forever, right? But even in science, do people, or they know about the uncertainty principle? So in science, one of the things that was found is when you observe an experiment and you use your instruments and all that, you change it. So just by being there and conducting the experiment under observation changes the outcome. So that questions what we mean by truth, right? Even scientific truth isn't always accurate. It may be close, but it's not absolute. So I mentioned Wittgenstein here, you know, who basically said, that's a table because all of us call it a table. Otherwise it doesn't exist. That seems pretty, pretty possible to me, right? I mean, I don't know what's, what's in the absolute, you know, a truth, right? Plato's cave and all we're seeing is images. Well, that may be. So we, we gravitate to people that agree that our truth, the thing that we think is true, they think is true, right? I want to be with people that have the same truths as I do. And in today's world with the internet and social media, you can find a large group of people who agrees with your idea of what the truth is. So once you have that group of people saying it's true, it's true. You got confirmation. And this is the dilemma we now find ourselves in, right? You look at somebody and you go, but here's all the facts. Here's all you're, that's not true. And they go, well, my 100,000 Facebook friends say it is, right? So I don't believe you. You're not telling me the truth. I feel something's fishy. 100,000 of my friends agree, right? So that becomes true. And then to layer on that, we are more isolated quite ironic than ever, right? We live in neighborhoods that don't cross boundaries. We go to schools that are generally segregated. I don't mean necessarily by race, by all sorts of things, right? Um, so you, you, know, you move to Boulder County to, to go to a good school system that you know is gonna be better than the county over, right? Um, and we stay with our same kind. I happen to believe, now I'm not a proponent of the military draft, but that was one of the great equalizers in our society, right? All these men got together from different backgrounds and they had to rely on one another. And that, you know, and some of you probably experienced that. I, I missed it by about a year. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, that's really, you know, one of the things that we don't have now. We don't have a place 
where people from different backgrounds, different experiences actually have to do something together or work together in any way, shape or form, right? So we, we are now isolated from birth to death in a way that we hadn't been before. Um, I do believe, frankly, that national service of all kinds would be really good for our country um, and really good for our relationships with one another. Are people familiar with this experiment? You ever heard of this? So basically, social psychologist takes two groups of kids and separates them in this, you know, in camp, essentially. Um, as you know, as is the case, these two groups name themselves. They, they focus on the otherness, right, of the, of the, the group. Um, and they start to become somewhat hostile towards one another. Um, sounds familiar, right? Then, basically, what he did is he, he sabotaged the, the place where they got water. And he said, you guys got to fix it. And all of a sudden, they had a common goal, a common issue that they needed to survive. And then they became buds and friends, right? I bet you've all had that kind of experience. But one of the things about survival for us as, as human beings is we're social creatures, right? Social creatures actually survive better than non-social creatures. Well, once there's the us, there's our group, there has to be the other group, right? It just, it's natural, right? We have ourselves, we have the Rotarians, and we have some other community group that we don't get along with. Or we may, but we don't want to admit it. Um, so that's, you know, that's very clear. Everybody familiar with oxytocin? Everybody heard of that? The love drug, right? Well, it's a hormone. Uh, it's very important for affiliation. The thing that's interesting about it is the minute they put, they, they will give someone an increased dose of oxytocin, they are affiliated with that person near them, but they are less affiliated with everybody else. Once there's the us, there has to be the them. It's part of how we survive. So if that's basic, then how do you overcome that? Well, the best way throughout history we've done that is have a war, right? You create your community, your nation, because you, you're going to fight the others who are threatening your survival. And you can, you can make that up, right? You can convince people. Um, and that's the, that's the Orwellian model of things, right? So I'm going to ask you, uh, what, what issues did you all come up with at your tables? We can just go around. Oh, microphone would be good. Yeah. You want to start up front here? Um, our, our issue that we focused on, I'm not sure we have an answer, but it was, it is political violence that is based on this issue that you're now talking about, you know, okay. untruths. Okay. So we are concerned about it has now evolved to the point where there is political violence, not just disagreement. Okay. Our group came up with the, the issue of encouraging our family, friends, associates to vote. Okay. It was a bit ironic, but it fits in. We, um, 
we decided that it was difficult to reach any consensus, that the things that keeping us from reaching consensus were the problem. We talked about the need uh, for listening with open minds and open hearts for understanding and without judgment. I'll preface ours by saying that you never said we had to succeed with what we no. <laughs> picked. And so we also picked political discourse. Uh, we also picked polarization. We talked more about mental health um, services. Thank you. We had two issues. The first was obviously to concentrate on the impact of climate change and a more um, a closer concern for the increasing levels of stress in young children. Did I miss anybody? Online. Um, I know this is going to come as a big surprise coming from me, but we chose uh, let's train people in the principles and tools for actually engaging in civil discourse to solve real world problems. Our action oriented group, and I ran in seven campaigns, we said, vote. Thank you. I think I got everybody. Did you want online? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and we just reiterated what several other tables said. We are in favor of uh, civil and respectful political discourse. Can we get back to the slide? Oh, there we are. Okay, that was great. Um, so I, I'm going to suggest that the winner was civil and political discourse which I think everyone here would agree is a threat to our survival, right? I'm gonna suggest that we need to get more concrete in order to meet our you know, people that we may not agree with, politically, whatever. Um, so, one of the things is what is something that we all agree is basic to our survival that we need to work on? So I just named a few, right? Very basic ones, right? Drought, the Colorado River drying up. That is a big issue that I think everybody in this state, many other states would agree we need to figure out how to work on. Um, Climate change, uh, I didn't use that term because it often is politically wrought, but how about you know, decarbonating our environment? Uh, road conditions, have you ever seen anybody disagree that the roads are bad and need to be fixed? No. How about disaster mitigation? How about getting together after the wildfire and trying to work on that? Whatever issue has a common goal. My growing up and many of yours, the common goal was staying out of the Vietnam War, right? And that was really a threat to our survival. And that unified a lot of people of all sorts of you know, disparate backgrounds. Thank you. 
so that's it for me. I'm open to any thoughts, questions, um, and I can go deeper if you like. So, yes. Oh, I'm going to come along with you. Oh, okay. I'd like to get your <clears throat> view of the effects of social media, um, you know, plus or minus. I saw yesterday that Tumblr got rid of nude photos four years ago, but they lost subscribers, so they're bringing back nude photos. I'm very negative about social media. I wonder what a psychiatrist's evaluation of it is. Yeah. Um, so the data that exists suggests, like it did in the, in when we were all concerned about TV, uh, that two hour, more than two hours a day on social media causes real issues. Uh, <coughs> under two hours, it seems to be okay. I don't know about that, but that's the, that's the psychiatric data. Um, as I mentioned, I think that one of the things that's happened with technology and social media is paradoxical, that we're actually more isolated than we ever were before. Um, if you talk to adolescents and teens, they're lonely and yet they're on their phones all the time, connecting, but they're not connecting to real people. They're connecting to some idea or image of it. And I think social media is certainly one of the fuels of our current you know, political discourse situation. Again, finding your, you know, finding your own group and that they have the answers for you. So, so my question is, um, if we basically are hardwired after year five, you know, how likely is it that we can modify that hardwiring later on? So uh, one of the nice things about the brain is it is plastic. It does change even, even at our age. Um, and it has, it is through experience, right? So you meet someone, you have all these ideas about them, you know, based on where they're from, whatever, and you sit down with them and you change your opinion of them. That's the brain changing, right? It has to be that way. That's the underlying thing that it occurs. So I, again, I, that's why we, you know, I believe and many others believe that these very concrete projects that make everybody feel better about their lives, better about their survival, will has the ability to change how we think about one another. I know there was another question, yeah. Uh, two of the takeaways that I had from, from your talk are one, working together, and then two, survival. So keeping those two things in mind, how do you reconcile what happened during COVID with some of the conspiracy theories and, and, and the great divisions that we had on how to deal with that? Mm -hmm. So um, if you believe, for instance, that the vaccine was a danger, right? Magnetized you or whatever, you know, you believed, then, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're going to say that's your survival is at stake if you take the vaccine, right? Others of us said, if you don't take the vaccine, your survival is at stake. And that's how we made our decisions, right? What happened with the, with, you know, COVID is a great example. Talk about isolation, right? Uh, you know, we were very isolated, right? I mean, I don't know how many times you folks have gotten together person since, but, you know, I'm still meeting people that I haven't seen in person until recently, you know, they're, I saw them on Zoom or whatever, right? Well, so COVID's a great example. We're very isolated. Where do we turn to? We turn to our groups of people that we know, right? And we interact with them virtually. We attend things that are of interest to us. <laughs> not you know universal and so we get more and more isolated to our individual or you know our groups and that group think and i think covid was the great is a great accelerator of what was already occurring 
we we have a uh, question coming from Merrill online. Okay. Yeah, thanks for speaking to the club. Appreciate it. Um, I agree with your concept on survival. Um, I'd suggest a parallel concept that goes along with it. Um, E.O. Wilson uh, theorizes we're also a youth social species. We're successful because we work as a group in competition for survival with other groups. So here's my question. Through the lens of group selection, how does truth compete with tribal loyalty in our political discourse? Truth versus loyalty. So um, I, <laughs> Uh, it depends on your group, right? Because in some groups, truth is about being loyal, right? Loyalty is the truth. It's the guiding truth concept, right? In other groups, it's, you know, it's discussion and, and you know, argument or, you know, uh, that is uh, the truth for them. I, I'm going to suggest that we don't come to common truth unless we interact with other groups, right? And the best way to, you know, again, it, it happens this way, right? We have an agreed upon thing we wanna work on. Let's just say, how do we fix the, the drought situation in the Colorado River? Well, you have a goal, you have a work group, right? Of all sorts of other groups who in common agree that this is a problem. And then what do, the, what do you do? You get to know each other. And all of a sudden, those issues of truth start to disappear, right? Because now you're saying, here's the truth that we're together on. And by the way, let me hear about some of your other things that you think are true, because they may be relevant. And it's so through that interaction, through knowing each other and working on something together, I want to emphasize that, that really does change our discourse and change our understanding of each other's groups. Okay. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, it's a little bit deeper in uh, my brother, Bob and I, not the Bob who's in the room, I'm just saying. Um, we have a fundamental disagreement about the political divide um, <laughs> I'm not certain he's interested in my survival sometimes, but uh, that's typical brother. But we do work together on stuff and we're family. So how do, what's the next step beyond like working on a project together? What's the next thing we can do to be, uh, to not devolve into um, the Lord of the Flies scenario? All right, well, first, you know, Families are a whole other set of issues. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, within family, um, it's very hard to come to that agreement. Why is that? Because we grew up with that issue from day one. You know, it's not just about political issues. It's about you were a mean sister or, you know, maybe not, you know, articulated, right? So um, it, we did this thing last year in, in, in Grand Rounds um, where we basically said, okay, how are you gonna be at Thanksgiving? How can you be at Thanksgiving? Um, so at my Thanksgiving table, um, I handed out little buttons with the peace sign on it. And I said, we're going to have peaceful discourse at Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, you, one of the way, best ways, honestly, for families to, to deal with that is to set ground rules, right? So really say, you know, we're not going to yell, we're not going to scream, we're not going to bring up stuff from 40 years ago, uh, maybe even 20 or 10. Let's talk about now and how can we do this in a peaceful, civil way, because we all do love one another, right? And, you know, you know the old line is, thank God Jesus said, love one another, right? Not like one another, right? <clears throat> wow. Okay, Steve, thank you for this. My pleasure. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah.
You, yeah, you're not quite done. Okay. Uh, but I, but I have to say that because boy, the, you, you hit it out of the park as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. So uh, we would like to honor you because I don't know if you know, but Rotary's been working on eradicating polio for a long time, <laughs> and we're real close. And so, in your honor. We're contributing 100 doses of vaccine to the polio fund in your name. All right, thank you. Thank you again.